All right, we're ready? So you have 20 seconds to answer each question, right? It's, it's a time quiz. Time quiz. Um, anybody else need time? If not, you can follow on the screen, inshallah, as well. All right, let's begin. So make sure you answer within the, the, time, the, time, the time frame. So you have 20 seconds to answer, runner. Make sure you answer within 20 seconds. Prophet said there are how many qualities? Whoever has them will taste the sweetness of Iman. Time's up. If you answer quicker, you get extra points. You're not part of, I thought you were part of the group. All right. Um, but I'm sorry, I just approved you, so you should be in now. You can scan that to show you on, on your own. <coughs> All right, moving on to the next question. Next question. When a person dies and enters his, the grave, his place in the next life is shown to him when? Morning and evening, right? Morning and evening. When a person enters their grave, their place is shown to them. If they're a par person of paradise, or the person of hellfire, they'll be shown their place in paradise or hellfire. Morning and evening. Morning and night. All right. Next question. In the hadith, you support belief in Qadr, divine decree. The Prophet said that so and so disputed or had an argument or had a debate. Just two people were that. Adam and Musa. Adam and Musa. All right, next question. It is sometimes permitted to blame Qadr, the divine decree for sins and mistakes. Answer is no, All right? We said that you cannot blame Qadr on your mistakes or your sins. Otherwise, Anybody would do whatever they want. All right, next question. <clears throat> Prophet said the best food anyone can eat is that which is earned by one's hands. And who is the person who used to only eat from the money which he himself had earned? Dawood, Prophet Dawood. All right, we got a pretty tight race coming. All right, next question. What is the Arabic term for resurrection after death? Resurrection after death. Al Ba'ath. Al Ba'ath. A little tricky. Qiyam is standing, right? Qiyam is standing. Hashar is gathering. Gathering. Hisab is account. Ba'ath is the, the word for resurrection, coming to, right? Coming, uh, coming, coming back from the dead. 
Al Ba'ath. Yawm Al Ba'ath is one of the names of the Day of Judgment. Okay, next question. According to the hadith, how many people will enter paradise without any reckoning? Without any reckoning. Seventy thousand. All right. Seventy thousand. You said seventy thousand? Okay. 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 <laughs> slip, slip of the finger here. Yeah. You have a quick finger. All right. Next question. The Prophet said, "Ward off the fire, even if." Only with blank. Specifically, something else. Half a date. With half a date. Okay, next question. A man has over blank branches or over blank branches. Main hadith of the entire class series. As we said, this hadith we need to know, right? We need to know this hadith. A man has either uh, 60 or 70, over 60 or over 70 branches. All right, uh, we're down to the last question, looks like. Last question. Prophet some said, none should blank without thinking well of Allah. You should not do this without thinking well of Allah. None should die, except you think well of Allah. Remember we said that <clears throat> when you're closer to death or when you're sick, then this is the time to increase in your hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None should die without thinking well of Allah. All right, um, that is. Third, all right, brother Ayam, got third, Nazar first. DR is initials, we don't know who that is. Somebody want to volunteer themselves? Might be a sister, actually, right? Who's the R to take the take the um, Daoud? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Jazakumullah khair. All right. So we'll start, inshallah, um, continue where we left off. Uh, the 14th branch of Iman. Al Iman will be wujubi Muhammad in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, this hadith has come, uh, the one after actually. It is narrated in the Sahihain by Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet said, None of you believes until I am dear to him, then his father, his child, and all mankind. Oh, yes. Um, before we move on, we, if any sister has a question, right, we have uh, on the screen this number, right, 347 541 4167. All right, so the sisters, if they have any questions, they can uh, text this number and uh, the. the the, the, the message will come here and we'll, we'll be able to answer inshallah. So any questions now or at the end of the session, you can use this number to text inshallah. We didn't get the, the mic, right? The mic downstairs? Okay. Okay, next. None of you believes until I'm dear to him than his father, his child, and all of mankind. None of you believes. Now, this statement means, or <clears throat> if we take it on its literal meaning, would uh, seem to indicate that if you don't love the Prophet more than your father, or your child, or all of mankind, then you're not a believer. Is that what is intended? Is that what is intended? To mean that you become a disbeliever if you don't fulfill the requirements of this hadith? No, the, the meaning of the hadith is that you don't have complete iman. Alright, complete iman. So the Prophet will use statements like this, none of you believe. Alright, you don't have belief, or you don't have iman. But it's not meant to negate iman completely, but it's meant to say that 
you don't have complete Iman. Complete Iman until you fulfill this condition, which is that the Prophet ﷺ is dearer to him than his father, his child, and all of mankind. Uh, and then in the other hadith, in the Sahihain by Anas radiallahu an, that the Prophet ﷺ said, there are three things. We, we meant this hadith, this is one of the quiz questions. There are three things which, when they are present in uh, anyone, will cause him to taste the sweetness of Iman. And the first thing mentioned is that Allah and His Messenger to be dear to Him than all else. What are the other two? Anybody knows the other two? The other two components of this sweetness of Iman. Three things are mentioned. The first, that Allah and His Messenger are to be dear to Him than all else. Anybody remember? The other two? Three things are from Halawat Iman, the sweetness of Iman. If you have these three things, you taste the sweetness of Iman. Good. Good. You love somebody? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. And the third? Good. Like you hate to do what? Like being hate like like being like hating to be thrown in the fire. Right? That was the, the full part of the hadith. So you hate to revert to kufr uh, just like you would hate to be thrown into the fire. Uh, it is also narrated in Sahih Hain that a man came, once came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, O Messenger of Allah, when will the last hour come? The Messenger وسلم, asks, what have you set aside for it? The man replied, O Messenger of Allah, I have not set aside for it any great amount of fasting or charity. And yet I love Allah and His Messenger. It's the key point of part, part of the hadith, that I love Allah and His Messenger. And so the Prophet وسلم, told him, you shall be th with those whom you love. You shall be with those whom you love. So we, know, we see here that the Prophet وسلم, did not answer the question. Why? Why didn't he answer the question when the man asked about the hour? Why didn't he answer the question? Think back to Hadith Jibreel. He doesn't know, right? Mal mas'ud anha bi a'lama min as sail The one who is questioned does not know anyone more than the one who is questioning. So the Prophet did not know the answer. So he's directing him to something more beneficial. We don't know when the hour is. But the more important question to ask is, what have you done to prepare for it? What have you done to prepare for it? And the man says that this is also, this hadith is a beautiful hadith for those who are lagging behind in actions. You know, you might be lagging behind in actions. This man says, I haven't done a lot of fasting. I haven't done a lot of charity. But I have one thing that I'm coming with, which is I love Allah and His Messenger. And that was enough. Rasulullah says, you will be with those whom you love. All right, so this is branch number 14. A man in the obligation to love the Prophet Wasallam. The next one is also connected to this uh, 14th branch. Al-Khamis Ashar min Shu'ab al-Iman al-Imanu bi wujubi ta'zim al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to uh, in the, the obligation to honor, venerate, and revere the Prophet ﷺ. It's not enough just to have love of Rasulullah ﷺ. It needs to be uh, paired with honoring him and revering him and venerating him. As Allah says in the Quran, right, that you may honor and revere him. Uh, and also in the verse, so that they have, say, they who have believed in him, honored him, supported him. And to apply this veneration or honoring of Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instituted a rule in the Quran which is you are not allowed to call Rasulullah by his name. Alright? Do not make your calling of the messenger like you call yourselves. So they were prohibited from saying Ya Muhammad. They were prohibited from, from addressing Rasulullah in that manner. Rather, they were, supposed to, they were supposed to address him as Rasulullah or Nabi Allah, right? Prophet of Allah or Messenger of Allah. And they were not allowed to call him Muhammad or Abul Qasim. What is Abul Qasim? It's Kunya. Why is this Kunya? Right, he had a son called Al Qasim. How many sons did the Prophet have? Three. Al Qasim, Abdullah, and Ibrahim. And they all died when. Uh, they were in, in infancy or before they reached, reached uh, puberty. So he had three sons uh, and he was nicknamed Abul Qasim. Abul Qasim. And uh, this was, uh, there was also uh, there was a rule as well that no one is allowed to take this kunya as well. No one is allowed to take this kunya so that the Prophet would be distinguished from everybody else. And also in the uh, verse, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله O you who believe, do not put yourselves before Allah and His Messenger. And the verse, لا ترفعوا أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي. Do not raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet All of this was, these are commands that were given to honor and 
uh, revered the Prophet ﷺ. When this verse was revealed, do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. There was a companion, he had a very loud voice. Right? He had a very loud voice, naturally. Naturally loud voice. So when this verse came down, he thought it was talking about him. And he stayed in his house, and he didn't come out, and he was just crying in his house. Until his other companion came, and he asked him, you know, what happened? And he says that this verse has come down because of me. And then they went to Rasulullah and Rasulullah told him that no, this is not because of you. And he gave him glad tidings of paradise. So this person had a natural loud voice. But there were some people who would raise their voices uh, over the Prophet ﷺ, especially the, the desert Bedouins. They would come and they didn't really have a lot of manners and they would speak very loudly. So Allah gave this commandment, do not raise your voices abo abo above the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. And now this, uh, this branch is higher than love. So we said that the previous branch is loving Rasulullah This is a higher degree. Since not everyone who loves reveres. A father loves his child and a master his slave, but does not revere him. Whereas all who revere must also love. Right? So uh, we have to couple love with reverence of Rasulullah And Not all love is the same. Right? So uh, the love that a father has for his child, it doesn't have this component of reverence. Right? Because a father has a higher status than the, the child. But this love that we need to have for Rasulullah is love along with reverence, along with honoring, along with venerating. This is the type of love that is required. Uh, and it's not just uh, mere love of Rasulullah As-sadis asr min shu'ab al-iman, shuh al-mar'i bi dinihi hatta yakun al-qadh fi ahabu ilayhi min al kuf One's firmness in his deen so that he would rather be cast into the fire than to leave Islam. And the same hadith has come back again. There are three things which, when they are present in anyone, will cause him to taste the sweetness of faith, the sweetness of Iman. And the third one mentioned, he just mentioned the third one here, that he should loathe to return to unbelief after Allah has rescued him from it, just as he would loathe to be cast into a blazing fire. All right? Um, the hadith mentions all right, that this is more beloved. All right? That, an yulqa fi nar ahabu ilayhi min an yarji ila kuf. Being thrown into the fire is more beloved to him than returning back to kufr. Does that mean that he loves that he loves to be thrown in the fire? What the hadith means is that it's easier. It is easier for him to be thrown into the fire than to leave his religion. All right, that's the meaning of the hadith. Not that he loves both of them, but one is more beloved to him than the other. But rather, a person they've reached this level of iman that it is easier for them to be thrown into uh, the fire rather than them to lead their religion. It's even easier, and uh, you know, we know how difficult it is to be thrown into the fire. Uh, but it is easier for that person to be thrown into the fire rather than to lose their religion. So this is the firmness that uh, is a branch of Iman. And is narrated in Sahih Muslim by Anas that uh, a man once begged from the Prophet and he gave him enough goats and sheep to fill a valley. He returned to his people and said, Enter Islam, for by Allah, Muhammad gives with no fear of poverty. And then the, the end of the hadith is uh, the point of mentioning uh, this branch or the, 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 the proof. People would go to the Prophet ﷺ wanting only worldly goods and would find before the day was out that their deen had become dear and more precious to them than the whole world. All right, so they, they went to Rasulullah ﷺ with dunya intentions. But then they would come out loving the, the religion more than anything else that would become the most precious thing to them. Now, sometimes a person might have uh, uh, an impure intention at the beginning, but this intention can change. And right? it can change. And that's why the scholars have mentioned that uh, when you're seeking knowledge, all right, even if you have a bit of like, you know, riya in it at the beginning, keep going, keep going. And eventually this niya, this, this intention will change into something good. So uh, a person... Even if your intention is not pure, it can change. It could always change. Uh, as these people, they were, they came looking for the dunya, but they left having, uh, becoming uh, more committed to their religion. Seeking knowledge, seeking knowledge, and this is uh, a long topic. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has mentioned many, many verses in the Quran about knowledge. Seeking knowledge, the virtue of those who seek knowledge, the virtue of those who have knowledge. I uh, mentioned a few of them. Seeking uh, ilm, knowledge of the exalted Creator and that which has come from Him, and ilm that prophets have been sent with. Now, the ilm that is mentioned here, 
and in, in, in this uh, particular branch and, and pretty much all the verses that we're going to mention the knowledge is referring to the knowledge of religious sciences all right so not doesn't mean that the other secular sciences are not important or blameworthy you could it's good to learn secular knowledge but when Allah praises knowledge the, the knowledge that he's praising always is the religious knowledge so all these verses that we're talking about are dealing with religious knowledge not to say that secular knowledge is not praiseworthy it is praiseworthy and it could be even obligatory in some situations but what Allah is mentioning here and Rasulullah SAW mentions in, in various hadith are all refer, referring to sacred knowledge the religious knowledge uh, which is what the prophets has been sent with and the knowledge of distinguishing attributes and of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sources of his laws such as the book referring to the Quran, the Sunnah, Qiyas, analogy, this is, these are all things that we'll study in fiqh inshallah, ijtihad, all things that we'll cover when we ha have some classes on fiqh inshallah. And the Quran and Hadith are full of statements about the merit of ilm and ulama, the people of knowledge. Only, it is only those who fear Allah from amongst his servants who have knowledge. All right? Only those who fear Allah from his servants are those who have knowledge. And Allah bears witness, Shahid Allah anahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu wa ulul ilmi qa'iman bil qis. Allah witnesses that there is no deity except for him. And so do the angels and so do those of knowledge. Allah mentions that three people bear witness to his tawheed. Himself, his angels, and the people of knowledge. Specifically, the people of knowledge. And in the verse, وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ He taught you that which you did not know. وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا And his favor upon you, Allah's favor upon you has been great. And the verse, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah will raise those who have believed amongst you and those who are given knowledge by degrees. And the verse, هَلْ يَسْتَوَ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are those equal who know equal to those who do not know. And these are a number of verses and many more talking about the virtue of knowledge and the virtue of seeking knowledge and the fact that those who have knowledge are not like those who do not have knowledge. And then we have the hadith in the Sahihain uh, that the Prophet says, Allah does not remove ilm by snatching it away from mankind, but does so by, rather by bringing to an end the lives of those who possess it, meaning causing the scholars to pass away. Until there shall come a time when not a single learned man remains, and the people appoint ignorant leaders for themselves, who when acts give opinions while having no ilm, no knowledge, being themselves astray, they cause others to stray as well. This is a very uh, serious hadith about the importance of knowledge. Uh, Rasulullah says that knowledge will be taken away, but it's not going to be taken away by Allah just taking the knowledge one night from somebody's heart. That's not how the knowledge will be taken away. Rather, the knowledge will be taken away by scholars dying, people of true knowledge dying. And once they die, there's nobody to take their place. Nobody to take their place. They have no students or no serious students. And so when they die, their knowledge dies with them. The knowledge dies with them. And so what happens afterwards when the scholars have died? The people are going to start to take others as scholars who are not, who have not fulfilled that the conditions of being a scholar or being a person of knowledge. So they'll take the ignorant as leaders. And these ignorant people will be asked questions. And they will give answers. They will give opinions. And because they don't have firm knowledge, firm grounding of knowledge, they will answer incorrectly. And so because they are, they are astray, they will cause others to go astray. So a very serious hadith about the uh, importance of knowledge and being careful when it comes to seeking knowledge and knowing who to seek knowledge from. Uh, a person might ask, how is that uh, knowledge is going to be taken away? But we have so much information available, right? Uh, we have in terms of, you can go online and you can find all the books, all the books of hadith, all the books of fiqh are there. You can go on YouTube, you can see lectures and classes, everything is available. But yet, knowledge is decreasing. Why is that? Because there's a difference between information and knowledge, right? Information and knowledge. What, is, what we have is a lot of information. But true knowledge, it remains in gatherings like this. 
All right, gatherings like this, and we'll see a, 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 the end. So I mentioned a hadith about gatherings of knowledge and the importance of gatherings of knowledge. So it's not enough just to have information. We have information everywhere. You can go on YouTube, you can type in Google, and you can get all the books and all the hadith. All, all, everything is there. But the knowledge is not there. The, the information is there. The knowledge is not there. Uh, and it's narrated in Sahih Muslim by Abu Huray radiallahu an, the Prophet says, whoever re rescues a believer from a worldly calamity shall have Allah rescue him from one of the calamities of the day of resurrection. Whoever is kind to someone who is bankrupt, to him Allah shall be kind in this world and in the next. Whoever conceals the fault of a Muslim, for him Allah shall conceal his faults in this world and in the next. Allah helps his slave as long as his slave helps his brother. And then the last part of the hadith is about seeking knowledge. Whoever treads a path in order to seek ilm, seek knowledge, for him Allah shall make easy a path to Jannah. Whoever treads a path in order to seek knowledge, for him Allah shall make uh, easy a path to, to Jannah. Never did a group of people gather in one of the houses of Allah, we're right, talking about the gatherings of knowledge, in order to recite his book and study it amongst themselves, except that Allah, Allah's tranquility will descend upon them. So four things happen. Allah's tranquility descends on them. The angels throng around them, the angels gather around them. And mercy covers them, and Allah mentions, makes mention of them in His presence. Four things that are present in the gatherings of knowledge. You won't find these four things by looking and, and researching online, from going on Google or YouTube. All right, these things are beneficial, they're beneficial, but they're not knowledge, they're information. But the knowledge is in the gatherings of knowledge, and these are things that you will not find in outside the gatherings of knowledge. That Allah's tranquility will descend upon those in, those in that gathering. The angels will gather around that person. Mercy will envelop them, and Allah will mention them, uh, of them in His presence. Allah will brag about them in His presence amongst those who are with Him. When a man falls, falls behind to his, due to his actions, his lineage will not hasten him forward. All right, back in those days, lineage was very important, right? If you had a high lineage, then you can you know, get away with things that others would not be able to get away with. But uh, Islam came and ended all that. Lineage has no, 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 no meaning or no bearing in the hereafter. Even if you are the family of the Prophet Sallallahu if you don't have Iman and Taqwa, then this will not save anybody. And Rasulullah Sallallahu when he was first giving the message, right? When he was first ordered to deliver the message, he called out to all his family members, Oh Fatima, Oh, uh, oh Abu Talib, Oh so-and-so, Sophia. He called all to them, all of them. And he said, I cannot save you from the fire, all right? I cannot save you from the fire. Even though you're a family of the Prophet that doesn't mean anything. I cannot save you from the fire. الثامن عشر من شعب الإيمان نشر العلم. All right, so this also goes hand in hand with the previous branch. Seeking knowledge is not enough. We need to also spread the knowledge. All right, we cannot hoard the knowledge. Uh, as the verse mentions, لتبينونه للناس ولا تكتمونه. That you must make it clear to the people and not conceal it. This verse was revealed to specific people. Anybody knows who it was re revealed to? This verse, and you must make it clear to the people and not conceal it. It was revealed to specific people. Who are those people, anyone? Huh? Prophets, but specifically a, a, a specific people from amongst the prophets. Bani Israel, Bani Israel, right? They, they had a bad habit. Bani Israel had a bad habit of concealing the, the verses, right? Concealing the Torah. Uh, so Allah mentioned or orders them that you have to make clear and you cannot conceal it. And then in the verse, for there should be, for there should separate from every division of them remaining to obtain uh, understanding in the deen and warn their people when they return to them that they might be cautious. This is a verse in the Quran where uh, Allah mentions that. Uh, when, they go, when, they, when they go out for battle, not everyone should be going out. And Allah orders that a group of people should be staying behind. And these are the, 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 the ulama, the class of scholars. So that they can teach the people. So even though uh, fighting was obligatory, Allah made an exception, which is that a group of people should stay behind. And those the specific group are those لِتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينَ Those who are going to learn the religion, learn the understanding of the religion, so that they can warn the people when they return. 
and they can use this knowledge and benefit others. So not everyone was ordered to go out. A group was, was ordered to remain so that they can be the ones to teach the people. And uh, when those, come, those uh, the fighters come back, then they could also learn their religion. And it is narrated in the Sahihain by Abu Bakr radiallahu an, that the Prophet in his sermon at Mina said, let those who are present inform those who are not. الشاهد منكم الغاهب That those who are present, let them inform those who are not. This is a, amongst, his last, amongst his last sermons uh, when a number of companions were there. And the Prophet told them, he, he gave them a number of advices and a number of lectures and a number of sermons. And he told them that those who are, are here, you should convey this to those who are not here. So this is a proof and evidence that when you learn something, you need to spread it and you need to let others know. And the end of this hadith is also a very interesting part of the hadith. And it may be that those who pass it on understand it less than some of those who hear it. So we have something called hadith, right? When they would pass down the hadith. And not because you pass the hadith necessarily means that you understand the hadith. So we had scholars who are muhadithun, right? They were specializing in transmitting the hadith. But it's not necessary that they know the meaning of the hadith. So you had another group of scholars called the fuqaha who are there to understand the hadith and tell them what the, the meaning of the hadith. So the Rasulullah uh, emphasizes this point that you have to pass, that, that pass this information on and it's possible that the one who gets this information, even though he didn't hear it directly, he understands it better than the one who's, who's passing the information on. He understands it better. He understands the true meaning of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the hadith or the words that Rasulullah has said. And it is narrated in Abu Dawood, Abu Dawood by Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, whoever is asked about something he knows and conceals it shall be made by Allah to wear a girdle of fire on the day of resurrection. So this is a warning about concealing knowledge. All right, so we have an order to spread the knowledge and also a warning to, uh, to those who conceal knowledge, who are greedy with the knowledge. Or some people, they might learn and then they just might um, sit around not doing anything and they don't want others to know. Right? They might just want to keep that knowledge to themselves. So this, is, uh, this person is under the threat of punishment on the Day of Judgment. All right, and then we have a few uh, statements of some of the scholars. We're not gonna read um, all of them. Um, inshallah, we can read those. you can read those on your own about uh, importance of knowledge and seeking knowledge and spreading the knowledge. Uh, moving on to Atasir uh, Ashar bin Shu'ab al-Iman, Ta'zeem al-Qur'an al-Majeed. Honoring the Qur'an, veneration of the Qur'an. And this is accomplished by learning and teaching it. So when we say we honor the Qur'an, it, it includes, you know, putting the Qur'an in a, in a good place, not putting the Qur'an in the floor, uh, not keeping the pages of the Qur'an ripped and untidy. All this is included. But the primary meaning of veneration of the Qur'an is learning and teaching it. Right? That's the primary meaning of uh, veneration of the Quran, learning and teaching it, and memorizing and respecting its laws and provisions, and knowing what is permissible, knowing what is impermissible, uh, fulfilling Allah's promises or uh, Allah's commands, and being aware of His promises and threats. We have a number of verses that talk about the status of the Quran. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لا رأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. Right, the greatness of this Quran is that if this Quran would have been set down on a mountain. You would have seen it humble, coming apart, crashing down the, the, the mountain, big strong mountain. If the Quran had been revealed on a mountain, then the mountain would have been crumbled and humbled and fall apart. And then the verse, إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنُ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابِ مَكْنُونٌ It is in a register, well protected. لَا يَمَسُهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَّهَرُونَ None touch it except the purified. It is a revelation from the Lord of the worlds. This verse here, none touch it except the purified, right? It is uh, used as evidence and proof that you're not allowed to touch the Qur'an uh, without being in a state of wudu, right? This verse is used as proof of that. None touch it except for the purified. None touch it except for the purified. It's evidence that you cannot touch the Qur'an except being, with it, being in a state of wudu. And another verse, if there was any Qur'an by which the mountains would be removed or the earth would be broken apart or the dead would be made to speak, it would be this Qur'an. But to Allah brings the affair entirely. And a uh, famous hadith of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمُ الْقُرْآنُ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best of you is one who learns and teaches the Qur'an. 
and hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari hold fast constantly to this Quran for by him whose hand lies the soul of Muhammad it escapes more easily than does a camel from its rope we all know especially those who memorize Quran right how quickly it goes if you don't review all right so Rasulullah says it's like uh, if you don't tie that camel it's gonna run away and it'll be quick to run away so just like that camel if you don't tie it and make sure that rope is firm just the Quran is just like that it goes very quickly if you don't review it and keep uh, constantly looking at it and uh, practicing and uh, and reviewing it and it's narrated in Sahihain by Ibn Umar that the Prophet said envy is permissible only in respect of two men or two people one whom Allah has gives his, uh, this book the Quran and the one who stands reciting it day and night and the one who Allah gives wealth which he gives in charity day and night so two people the Prophet says envy is permissible the one who Allah has given the Quran and this person recites it day and night and the second is a person who Allah gives wealth and this person spends it in charity day and night all right what is envy what is envy the Arabic term what is the Arabic term for envy hasad what is the meaning of envy what is the meaning of envy okay mm -hmm. right tamanni zawal an ni'ma an al ghayr to wish for a favor or Allah's blessing on somebody to be removed all right it's not only that you want something but you want that thing to be removed from that person all right and this is this is more than just jealousy this is what we call envy hasad when somebody has something and not only do you want it but you want it to be removed from that person all right and this is what Allah tells us to seek refuge in in him from I mean hasidin idha hasad all right this is a very serious illness of the heart that you want something removed from somebody else so the hadith says envy is permissible except for these right so what is meant here is that meant is the envy that we just mentioned meant obviously not right because we cannot ever want Allah to take away these bounties from somebody else so the scholars have mentioned what is meant what is meant here is something called ghibta, which is that you want like that person has that you want what they have without wanting it to be taken away all right so this is called something called ghibta, which is that you want to be like that person so a person has Quran I want to be like them this is permissible or a person has a lot of wealth and they give it in charity I would like to be like them this is permissible and Rasulullah mentions that you could, it's permissible in these two but it's actually in anything good but he emphasizes these two to show that it's important these, uh, that these two things are important but in, in, in fact anything that's good you can wish that you would be like that person right? so it's not limited to just do these two things it could be anything that's good but Rasulullah singles out these two to show its importance all right so envy here is not the meaning uh, that we just mentioned where you want something to be taken away but rather it, it, the meaning here is that you wish to be like that person you wish to have what that person has and it's also narrated in Sahih Muslim by Umar radiallahu anhu the Prophet says indeed Allah elevates through this book some people and degrades others Allah elevates Allah elevates some people through this book those who act on, on it and other people those who don't act on it then they will be degraded and it will be as uh, the hadith says well, Quran, lak, lak, aw Quran is either going to be a proof for you or it's going to be a proof against you depending on whether you act on it or not uh, so as we can see here now he's mentioning some actions right? and we as mentioned at the beginning of the, of the class that iman is belief statements actions right? belief statements actions so now he's going to mention some of the actions and everything here that we're mentioning you can think think of this as a checklist for iman right think of this as a checklist so you're going down you're going down the list we should have everything checked off so far right everything should be checked off so far there are some things that we're going to see that are, are situational you might not be able to apply it on only 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 uh, if you're in certain situations right like for example uh we're going to see something called a which is guarding the borders those who guarded the borders right we don't live in a Muslim country where we have borders that we need to guard so that's situational we're not going to be able to apply that particular branch of Iman but uh, mo majority of them are things that we can easily attain but so far what we've covered here everything should be checked off all right everything should be checked off uh, because these are necessary components of Iman 
Uh, so we have a taharat, specifically referring to wudu and ghusl and anything else in that place. Uh, Allah says, when you rise to perform the salah, إِذَا قُمْتُمْ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ فَاغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ وَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ When you rise to perform the salah, wash your faces. This is a verse on wudu. Right? This is a verse on wudu. Wash your faces and your forearms up to the elbows and wipe over your heads and wash your feet to the ankles. This is a verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah on wudu. And uh, the narration in Sahih Muslim, purification is half of iman. Al-Tuhuru shatru al-iman. Purification is half of iman. And alhamdulillah, fills the scale. Tamla al-mizan. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, tamla'ani aw tamla'u ma bayna al-samai wal ard. And saying subhanallah, and alhamdulillah, uh, fills what is between the heaven and the earth. And salah is light. Charity is a proof. Steadfastness is radiance. The Quran is either a proof or argument for you or against you. As we just mentioned that uh, hadith. All people shall come, some having sold their souls, either freeing them or bringing about their destruction. Uh, and then we have the uh, hadith. Allah does not accept salah without taharat. And no charity is accepted that comes from fraud. So we know that uh, salah is, the condition of salah is wudu. You must have wudu in order to pray or else the salah is invalid. Uh, and this is the hadith that mentions that. That salah is not accepted without taharat, which is purification. Uh, then he mentioned some of the other, uh, some statements from some of the scholars. This part of the hadith that we mentioned, at-tuhuru shatr al-iman, purification is half of faith. What is iman mean, meant here? Salah, right? The meaning of iman here is salah. And Allah sometimes uses the word iman to mean salah. And we will see a verse later on, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ That will be mentioned later on. That uh, Allah will not allow you to lose your iman, meaning your salah. It's a verse about uh, when the, the qibla was changed. We'll, we'll see that verse later. But the meaning of iman here is uh, salah. Purification is half of iman, meaning purification is half of salah. That your salah, you need to have purification, wudu, before it can be accepted. Al-Hadi wal Ashroon min Shu'ab al-Iman al-Salawat al-Khams. Alright, so this is obviously related to what comes before. You have to have wudu before you can pray. So wudu is a condition for the salah. Salawat al-Khams, the five uh, salawat. Uh, the, the verse that we just mentioned, and never would Allah have caused you to lose your iman. The uh, word iman here refers to salah. It refers to salah. This verse was revealed when the qibla was changed. So we know that the qibla was first to Jerusalem. And they prayed to the Qibla in Jerusalem for a number of years. And then it was changed to Mecca. So the companions, they had a very big concern, which was that a lot of the companions who were killed, right, they were killed before this change happened. They, all their salah were prayed toward Jerusalem. So they were very concerned, what happens to their salah? Is it going to be accepted now that the Qibla has changed? So Allah revealed in this verse that those who prayed to the Qibla in Jerusalem, and then they died and they never had a chance to pray to the, the Qibla in Mecca, Allah is not going to nullify those prayers that they had. And never would Allah have caused you to lose your iman, meaning you lose your salah. So those prayers that they prayed to Jerusalem all, were all valid. Right? So Allah assured them that these uh, salahs are valid. And even though the Qibla was changed, those salahs that were there were valid because they were valid at that time when the Qibla was to Jerusalem. And the verse in the Salat كانت على المؤمنين كتابة موقوتة. Indeed, Salat has been decreed upon the believers a decree of specified times. We know that in the Salat have specified times. They begin a certain time and they end at a certain time. And the Hadith of Jabir, that which separates a person from polytheism and unbelief is Salat. Right? This is a very serious Hadith about the difference between a polytheism and unbelief is Salat. And there's no other uh, action, there's no other pillar in the religion where Rasulullah calls it, leaving it kufr, other than salah. So we have a, a few hadith, this is one of them, which is indicating that a person who leaves salah is as if they have disbelieved. And the scholars have differed about, uh, about that. A person who completely leaves salah, are they still a believer or not? Because there are hadith, Al-Ahdul ladhi baynana wa baynahum as-salah. Faman tarakaha faqad kafar. The, the, the covenant that is between us and them, the disbelievers, is salah. 
So whoever leaves it has disbelieved. Rasulullah has called those who leave the salah as disbelievers. And scholars have a huge debate whether a person who has left salah is still a believer or not. Although the majority of scholars say that they still remain believers. They still remain believers, but their iman is in doubt. All right, so this, the salah is very important. And no other action does Allah uh, call the one who leaves it as a disbelief or a disbeliever other than salah, no other action. And then we have the hadith Ibn Mas'ud where he asks, what is the most beloved to these uh, most action, action most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he replied, as salatu uh, ala waqtiha. Salah in its correct time. And then what comes next? Kindness to parents. And then what comes next? Jihad in the path of Allah. This question came to Rasulullah a number of times. What is the best deed? And sometimes he would answer in different ways, um, in different order. Uh, and so the scholars have mentioned that these, uh, it's not, the order is not meant to be taken necessarily in that way. Uh, but the, the answer the Rasulullah gave sometimes were specific to specific people. So this particular person, when he asked this question, maybe he had parents. And so Rasulullah mentioned kindness to parents as the second thing. But there are other hadith who have mentioned different things, different order. All right, uh, so th these hadith are not meant to be taken necessarily in that order, but Rasulullah would answer according to the person who's asking the question. So he sees that person, they are not paying attention to their salah, or praying it on time. So he says salah in its correct time. For you, it's the, most, the best deed. Kindness appearance, for you, this is the best deed. Or jihad in the path of Allah. So we see, we see this, that Rasulullah would, would be asked this question multiple times, and different answers would be given. And this is how the scholars would reconcile uh, these different answers given. Uh, then we have the hadith uh, Salah is, is 20, 27 times more virtuous When prayed in jama'ah uh, This is an encouragement to come to the masjid And pray in the jama'ah 27 times more virtuous than praying uh, By yourself 27 times uh, Alright, we'll move on to the next uh, branch وَالْعِشْرُونَ مِنْ شُعْمِ الْإِيمَانِ Uh, in between when it starts and when it ends. As long as you pray in between that, then then that then you have caught the salah. But praying at the beginning of time is also a special virtue. So at the beginning, there's even a more special virtue, praying at the beginning, early. Alright, but um, it needs to be there's a there's an end time for a reason, meaning that you can pray at the end. Otherwise, there would be no need to specify beginning and end if you only had to pray at the beginning, beginning. So you can pray any time from the beginning to the end, but it's more virtuous to pray. At the beginning, at the, at the earliest time. Athani wal ashru min shu'ab al iman al zakah, right? Uh, the and it's, it's mentioning all the pillars of Islam, right? Uh, one after the other, the uh, charity, the charity, the obligatory charity, and salah and zakah always go hand in hand. Allah always mentions them together. Wa ma umiru illa li abdullah muqtusin al hudin. Uh, no, that's a different verse, right? Uh, to, to establish waqim al salah wa atu al zakah. No, that's the verse, right? In Surah Al-Bayna. Wa ma'aminu illa li'abdu Allah muqtusin al-hudin al-hunafa' wa yuqimu al-salah wa yu'tu al-zakah. Wa thalika deen al-qayyim. And they were not commanded except to worship Allah, be sincere to Him in deen, inclining to truth, and to establish salah, and to give zakah, and that is the correct deen. And not other, always, Allah always combines these two together, salah and zakah. Wa qimu al-salah wa atu al-zakah. They always go hand in hand. And this is why when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he became the Khalifa, some people, they said, we used to pay zakat to Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu but we're not going to pay zakat to you. All right, we used to pay to the zakat to the Prophet Sallallahu but we're not going to pay to you. But we're still going to pray. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, he fought them. He sent armies after them. He said, I'm going to fight anybody who separates between salah and zakat. Because Allah commands them together all the time. So if anybody separates between the two, then he waged a war on them. So he fought them. And this is well known in the time period of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh. And then a warning to those who hoard, who do not pay the zakat. And those who hoard gold and silver and, and do not spend it in the way of Allah, give them tidings of a painful punishment. The day when it will be heated in the fire of hell and seared therewith uh, will be their foreheads, their flanks, and their backs. And it will be said to them, So this is what you hoard for yourselves, so taste what you used to hoard. And back in those days, they used to have the, the, right, the, the actual coins, gold and silver coins. So these gold and silver coins will actually be brought on the Day of Judgment. It will be heated, 
it will be heated and then it will be placed on them and they will be burnt with it all right and these days obviously we don't use the coins anymore but the punishment will be something similar allah will punish you with the same money that you withhold that that same money that you hoard if you don't give the zakat then that same money will be a source of punishment for you on the day of judgment and let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given to them of his bounty ever think that it is better for them. Some people might think that by, you know, if I avoid paying this zakat, then you know, my bank account will not go down. Right? It's gonna, I don't want my bank account to go down, then I'm not going to be able to feed my family. So Allah says here, do not think that if you withhold, that this is better for you. All right? Rather, it is worse for you. It is worse for them. The next will be encircled by that which they withheld on the day of resurrection. And then the, the hadith of Mu'adh, Rasulullah taught, sent him as a uh, teacher to the people of Yemen. And he gave him instructions. He said to them, or he said to Mu'adh, an, you are going to a people who have scripture. You are going to Ahl Kitab. So first, first thing first, call them to testify that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. Call them to Tawheed first, first thing. And that I am Rasulullah. If they accept this, then move to the second thing, which is teach them that Allah has obligated five salah upon them every day. And if they accept this, then go on to the third, most important thing, which is that Allah has given them, uh, ob obligated, obligated on, upon, upon them a charity to be taken from the wealthy amongst them and given to their poor. If they accept this, then beware of taking any more of their wealth. And beware also of the, uh, the dua of the oppressed, for there is no veil between such a dua and Allah. Be careful of the dua of the oppressed, because there is no veil between Allah and the dua of the oppressed. Um, all right, moving on. The next uh, hadith is also about those who do not uh, give the zakah. Moving on to the next uh, branch of iman. The fourth or the twenty-first in shu'ab al-iman, al-siyam. Right, so we mentioned all of the pillars of Islam. Uh, of course, we know that the month of Ramadan is coming up uh, very, very soon, and this uh, is a reminder for us to start uh, getting to the mental preparation for Ramadan, right? We have to mentally prepare ourselves. In addition to physically preparing ourselves, we're mentally preparing ourselves. Uh, now is the time to do so, as we are, which, which month are we in? Which month are we in? Rajab, right? So we have Rajab, we have Sha'ban, and then we have Ramadan. So we only have, um, what, less than two months to go before Ramadan. Uh, so we have the 23rd branch of Iman, fasting. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu kutiba alaykum siyam Fasting has been, been prescribed for you as it has been prescribed for those before you. And we have the hadith that Islam is built on five things, the five pillars. Amongst them is the fasting. And the hadith on the virtue of fasting, the reward of fasting. Abu Huraira narrates, every good action made by man shall be multiplied by tenfold. Every good action you do, the minimum reward you get is ten. Right? The minimum reward you get is ten. Man ja'ab al hasanit Whoever brings one good deed, Allah will multiply by ten. The minimum of any good deed you do is at least ten. At least ten. And this can go all the way up to seven hundred. Alright, so the normal the normal scale for rewards is between ten and seven hundred. So any good deed you do, it's gonna be between that. Depending on your sincerity and how well you perform that action, it can go from ten to hundred to five hundred, all the way up to seven hundred. So this is where a normal action will fall in terms of reward. Except for fasting. Fasting does not follow this normal scale. Uh, Allah says, this fasting is for me. And I shall reward it myself. The scholars have mentioned that means that fasting is beyond the 700. So the normal scale of rewards is 10 to 700. Fasting goes beyond that. It goes beyond the 700. And so it does not fall under the normal scale of rewards. Fasting is for me. Except for fasting. It does not fall under this normal scale for rewards, fasting is which is for me, and I shall reward it. Uh, I shall uh, I uh, shall it reward it myself. For a man renounces his food and his desire for my sake. A fasting person has two joys: when he breaks his fast and when he meets his Lord. The order of the fasting person's mouth is sweeter to Allah than the smell of musk. And fasting is a shield. Yes, because the only exception mentioned here is fasting, except fasting. All right, except fasting. All the other good deeds, 10 to 700. And possibly if Allah, Allah is, wills, He can make something more than that. But normally, 10 to 700, except for fasting. Fasting is unlimited. 
unlimited rewards. Yeah. No, you can do it any other month. But obviously, the, the, yeah, but obligatory fasting is in Ramadan. Yeah. Yeah, in general. In general. The act of worship itself of fasting. Right? Due to what it is, uh, what we do when we're fasting, which is giving up something for Allah. So because we're giving up, this is patience. Allah says about patience. That Allah gives the reward of those who are patient without any reckoning, without any uh, limit. This is connected to uh, fasting, although it is not conditional. You can make i'tikaf without fasting, but usually i'tikaf and fasting go hand in hand because the time for i'tikaf is, uh, the sunnah is for the, the i'tikaf to be done in Ramadan in the last 10 nights. So he brings it here, although it's not a condition for i'tikaf that you be fasting. You can make i'tikaf now, right? You can, have, you can intend i'tikaf outside of Ramadan, and it doesn't have to be in Ramadan, it does not have to be when you're fasting. Al-I'tikaf. Uh, and the verse, وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ أَنْ طَهِرَ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالْرُوْكِعِ السُّجُودِ When uh, Ibrahim and Ismail were building the house, the, the Kaaba, Allah mentions to purify this house for three categories of people. The Ta'ifin, those who are making Tawaf. And the Aakifin, those who are making I'tikaf. And those who are bowing. Bowing and prostrating. And it's not narrated in the Sahih that Aisha radiallahu anha said that Rasulullah used to enter i'tikaf for the last 10 days of Ramadan until Allah took his spirit. Afterwards, his wives did the same. Uh, and the hadith, whoever does i'tikaf for the time between two milkings, a moment, a very short moment, is though he is freed from uh, hell, freed from the fire of hell. Al Khamis al Shurun. We'll take this last one, inshallah, uh, for tonight. Al Hajj. Al Hajj. The fifth pillar of Islam, Al Hajj. And Allah says, uh, And to, due to Allah from, from the people is a Hajj to the house, whoever is able to find there to a way. And also the verse, And to proclaim to the people the Hajj. They will come to you on foot, on, on every lean camel. And they will come from every distant deep. Uh, Ravine, I think that's a valley, right? Um, should be. Okay, yeah. And complete the Hajj and Umrah for Allah. So this verse here, where Allah says that they will come to you, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he, when Allah gave this uh, command, to call the people for Hajj, there was nobody there, right? Mecca was completely barren and completely empty. Nobody is there. And Allah told him, "You give the call, and they will come. People will come. They're going to come." From on, on foot, on, on every lean camel, from every diff, distant, uh, deep valley. This should be a valley, I don't know. Uh, the, the word, have you ever heard this word before? Ravine? What does it mean? Yeah, valley, right. So it means a valley. So they will come to you from every part of the world. And we see this today, alhamdulillah, that uh, the Hajj, millions of people come and they congregate in this one place, fulfilling what Allah says, that they will come to you on foot, on any le every lean camel, for every distant deep valley. And we have the hadith that Islam is built on five pillars, and we mentioned the, uh, this hadith before, the Hajj is the last one. And um, we'll end with this uh, one statement uh, that's mentioned, whoever is not, is not prevented by illness or any need or a tyrant, and does not perform the Hajj, let him die a Jew if he wishes, or a Christian, very serious hadith, uh, which is warning to those who do not perform Hajj. Hajj is very important. This is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Does Hajj need to be performed right away or can you delay it? All right, there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars regarding this, but no doubt that uh, you need to perform the Hajj before a person passes away. And so performing the Hajj as early as possible is always better. Even though many of the scholars say that it can be delayed, even if you have the means, you can delay it. However, of course, uh, if they, they say that if you delay it, and you had the means to do so, and then you die without performing it, then you are accountable for that. So if once a person has the means to perform the Hajj, then they should uh, perform the Hajj as soon as they're able to, as long as there's no, nothing preventing them from doing so.
Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen We stop there on the 25th branch of Iman And inshallah we continue uh, with number 26 And uh, we'll end off with any questions Inshallah with any questions The question is, do you have to be in a state of wudu to read Quran from your phone? Are you touching the screen? Or are you just reading from your phone? Reading. So, so the, yeah. So this comes, this is a modern question, modern fit question, which is the Quran that we find on the screen, is that, does that take the ruling of the Mus'haf or not? So some of the scholars say that it does. It takes the ruling of the Mus'haf. Another scholar say that it does not. That it, um, it takes the ruling of a mirror. Like if you have a mirror, right? And the, the, the Quran is reflecting on the mirror, and you touch the mirror, and you don't have wudu, is that sinful or not? No, right? If, so it, understand the scenario. If you have a mirror, and the reflection of the Quran is in the mirror, and you touch the mirror, is that touching the Quran? No. So some of the scholars, they say that, Touching the Quran that's on the Mus'haf is like touching the mirror. Touching the mirror, which means that it's not actually a Mus'haf, it's not actually a Quran. Because one minute it's there, the next minute you click the button, it's gone. All right? Other scholars say that it takes the ruling of the Mus'haf. Um, there's a different opinion. The, the best thing would be to be in a state of wudu. Uh, to be in a state of wudu, but to, to, to say that it takes the ruling of the Mus'haf, it's, um, it's difficult to say that because of the fact that. It's not a mushaf. It could, when you click a button, it can be easily removed. So it's not necessarily the ruling of a mushaf. But it's better to be on the safe side uh, to have wudu when you're touching the screen, when you're touching the words. Even if though we can say that it, ne it doesn't necessarily take uh, the ruling of the mushaf. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, at the very beginning, the very first session we had on the Hadith of Jibreel, we said that Iman represents the inner dimension, the, the inner beliefs. But here we have Iman is everything together, right? And we, uh, so we, we mentioned this before as well, that Iman has two meanings. There's a general meaning, which is synonymous to Islam. The general meaning, synonymous to Islam. And then we have a specific meaning, which is the inner beliefs. So what's being referred to here is the general meaning, which is synonymous with Islam, which is synonymous with Islam. And this is belief, statements, and actions. All right, so what's mentioned, what we're referring to here is Iman in the general sense, which is synonymous with Islam, which is the religion, the religion of Islam. So what we, when we say here the, 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 uh, the branches of Iman, we can also say the branches of Islam. All right, and then we have the pillars of Islam, which are the integrals. And then you have the branches, which is everything else that we're mentioning here. All right, yeah. Repeat the question. The highest form of ibadah between salah and fasting. Okay, yeah, no doubt salah, no doubt salah. Um, salah is, it's always mentioned right after, right? Uh, the first thing mentioned in the hadith. And it's the only, it's the only action where Rasulullah describes uh, the one who leaves it as, uh, as committing disbelief. As committing disbelief. So the salah is the most important. And there's a hadith in, uh, well, as well that the first thing you will be questioned about on the Day of Judgment is the salah. Awal ma yuhasabu bihi al-abd yawm qiyamah salah The first thing the person will be questioned about is the salah. And then everything else will come after. So the salah is the most important pillar after the shahada. And then everything else comes after. Yeah. Wait, he has a follow up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, number one, the, they they came to um, Imam. Uh, 
yeah, oh, the, the question is, the, the woman, when she has her menses, she has to make up the fast, but she doesn't have to make up the salah. So, uh, I assume you're saying that if the salah was more important, she should be making up the, the salah too, right? And not, uh, not only the fast. All right? Uh, so that, yeah, in that sense, yeah. <clears throat> so, people came to uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, they said that, you know, you are using your opinion a lot. You know, you're, you're trying to use your opinion to, to interpret the religion. So Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Hanifa, he responded, he said to them, uh, the fasting woman, does she have to make up her fast? And the person said, yes. The woman who is in her menses, does she have to make up her salah? Uh, and, he, and they said, no. So he said, if I was, as you describe me, which is I'm using my opinion and my intellect to interpret the religion, then I would have told you that the woman should be making up her salah uh, just like she makes up her fast. But the, the religion is not based on intellect. And he's trying to prove this point, Imam Abu Hanifa, that the religion is not based on intellect and our opinions, uh, but it's rather how, this is how Allah has made it. So even though we say our salah is more important, yet the women have been ordered to make up the fast, but not the salah. And the scholars have mentioned wisdom behind this. One of the wisdoms is that uh, if she has to make up the salah, it's a lot. Versus making up the fast. It's a lot easier to make up one fast or two fast. She, miss, if she, miss, if she misses uh, seven days of salah. How many salahs is that? Right? That's a, a whole week's worth of salah she has to make up. So they mentioned that uh, the wisdom is that it's much easier to make up the fast than have it to make up. If we, especially some women, if their period goes on longer than seven days, then they have to make up you know, a, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of salawat. So there's a wisdom in that, that Allah has made it's a, it's a, means, a means of ease, means of ease. But uh, we, don't, we can't use that to say that salah or fasting is higher than salah.